Good morning. This is the sermon for Peace Hill Christian Fellowship for January 10th, 2021. Uh, this morning we're going to be, or I'm going to be preaching on Psalm 119, uh, verses 1 through 3. Uh, psalm 19, 119, excuse me, is a, is a sectioned psalm. Uh, it is an acrostic on the Hebrew alphabet, and so the sections run uh, along each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So instead of A, B, C's, it's Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalit. Um, and this first section, verses 1 through 8, is uh, under the, the heading of Aleph, which is the, the Greek, I'm sorry, the Hebrew <laughs> uh, letter for A. And it's used, this psalm was used to teach Hebrew children to read, but also to teach them something about the spiritual life and the spiritual journey. And uh, so I'm going to preach on the first three verses of this psalm, and uh, I will preach on the subsequent verses, uh, the rest of, of 1 through 8, in, in uh, later sermons. And I just want to begin by reading this short section. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the laws of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do nothing wrong. They walk in his ways. Now, these verses give an overview of the spiritual journey. Um, we're going to look at just the first part of that overview in this section of the psalm. And this, these three verses talk about uh, the ideal of the blessed life. So these verses describe an ideal of the spiritual life um, that was given to Hebrew children as an orientation, a way to begin thinking about what it meant to live the spiritual life. With our modern eyes, we can be very we can tend to be very dismissive of verses like these. And I, I think that it's important to say um, that we need to recognize that this is not a perfectionistic code. And, and particularly uh, given, that, given that last section where it says they do nothing wrong and they walk in, in his ways, uh, that, that can be something that gives us pause because all of us, I think are, are very aware that the statement that we would do nothing wrong is is beyond us. Um, but that that misses the point of what the writer of Psalm 119 uh, wants to say. The writer is presenting a, a vision of the blessed life, uh, a life that would be at peace so that those who follow it would have no need to be ashamed or to find themselves in trouble. Uh, students of the spiritual life were first to learn this ideal. Again, not as some impossible or rigid code of laws, but as something that was truly worth pursuing. Uh, they were to become convinced that the great and worthwhile goal of the spiritual life is love for God and his ways. And it is worth saying that uh, part of being convinced of this is coming to this understanding that what God truly wants for us and our lives, what God truly wants for you and for me, is that our lives would be blessed, that, that we would thrive, that we would be at peace, uh, that we would be able to live without shame or fear, that we would live lives that are stable and have good influence on other people and are, are healing to ourselves. So I want to look at um, this vision, which is stated in four statements in these verses. And uh, I want to begin with just the, the first, the, they're stated in phrases, I want to begin with the first phrase. And that is that we would learn to live the blessed life by paying attention to our ways. Um, the psalm says, uh, blessed are those whose ways are blameless. 
So, paying attention to our ways, uh, that word ways, it's one of those words, it's a common word, it's easy to miss and skip over. But if you think about, there are many places in Scripture that talk about considering our ways, our, our thought patterns, our speech patterns, our patterns of behavior, um, reflecting on those and learning to be blameless or to move towards a more blameless way of acting and living and speaking and thinking. Um, so that's, that's an important, there's an important question here. How many of us really have stopped to think about our ways? Uh, sometimes someone will point out something to me. They'll say, well, you know, you, every once in a while, um, or generally speaking, uh, you talk this way, or you react to this situation, or this is a habit of yours, and it will completely catch me by surprise, um, because I haven't really thought about uh, how, I'm, how I'm speaking. And what they're doing is they're pointing out they're pointing out one of my ways of speech um, because we're not always aware of our ways. We're not always aware of how we're coming across. We're not always aware of, of the, the ways that our thoughts move and where they take us because, of course, life proceeds from what is in the mind and what's in the heart. Um, we have ways and patterns that, and, and they tend to define if you think about it, our behavior, uh, even though we seldom think about these ways. Um, but some of our ways are destructive, and they bring trouble into our lives and to the lives of others, or they're dishonoring to God. And, and there can be times when somebody points out something about our habitual ways of living that we realize are distorted, are harmful, either to us or to someone else. Um, there is a real blessing in coming to know our own ways, paying attention to our, our own habits, our patterns, and shaping them, thinking about shaping them to honor God or to bless other people, or both, really. Um, and, you know, you may have to ask someone, preferably someone that you trust, to uh, talk to you about what they have noticed about your ways, and that can be, that can be very painful. It can be very painful to hear these things. And I think a lot of the time, um, we probably prefer not to have someone point out our ways. Because we know, we know down inside that change is difficult and being confronted with our failings is, is difficult and it puts a pressure on us. But this is part of the, this is part of the healing. So, so again, uh, this is a way in which we come towards this goal of living a life that is blessed, that is good, that is whole, if I can put it that way. Um, but that change, again, it cannot even begin to happen until um, not only are we made aware of what our ways are, but until we begin to take the time to reflect on our ways and reflect on uh, what change would cost us the the uh, the reality of what it means to move towards blamelessness, which is a goal. It's not here again. Uh, we're not saying um, perfection here. We're talking about moving away from blame from blame from from things that we are doing that are causing harm. Uh, this is the beginning, first statement of what would have been the ABCs for Hebrew children. Imagine that. The first thing that Hebrew children would have learned to think about would have been self-awareness. 
What am I like? What are my ways like? Uh, so this is this is basic to our to the spiritual life. And again, if we if we don't know, we aren't paying attention to our ways. That is something that's incredibly important. Uh, secondly, um, by by uh, following God's laws, delighting in God's laws, we learn to live a blessed life by delighting in God's laws. And I'll, I'll go again back to the psalm, which says, um, uh, Blessed are those uh, who walk according to the laws of the Lord. Uh, as modern Protestants, we are very worried about legalism. And whenever we hear the word law, and uh, we know the New Testament, uh, there's alarm bells go off. And we're so afraid of, of legalism. But I want to say that there is a, a huge difference between uh, using God's law to justify ourselves, uh, looking down on others and feeling superior, or justified because of some comparison where we come out uh, on top, and, uh, and actually delighting in God's laws. So the opposite of legalism is not ignoring the law. And not saying, well, the law doesn't refer to me, it doesn't affect me, the law has nothing to do with me. Uh, the law includes the Ten Commandments. They certainly have something to do with me. Uh, the opposite of legalism is delighting in the law and applying it to ourselves in, in deep ways. Uh, it is about recognizing the fact that the God who made us and made our souls and made our lives and made us to be people who are joyful and blessed, um, offers us not just some legal arrangement, right? Uh, some arrangement where uh, we can get out of hell, but a whole new way of life, a whole new way of living that actually blesses our lives. So that life is actually a life that consists of understandings and laws that bless me individually, they bless people who are around me. Uh, for example, don't murder. You know, uh, if the legalistic way of looking at don't murder is to say, well, if I don't murder, then I'm better than a person who's a murderer. I'm better than someone who's in jail for murder, who has committed murder. Delight in the law is much more like what Jesus does in the Sermon on the Mount, where he says, uh, you've heard it said, don't murder. But I'm telling you that if you despise, hold in contempt a person, if you hate a person, you, murder is already in your heart. You, you are already causing yourself uh, harm. You are already self-toxic. You are are toxic to others. Uh, you are bringing yourself under judgment. You are, you are internally destroying yourself through hatred and bitterness. That is not the blessed life. So, so delighting in God's laws, learning to think about God's ways. And I think when we think about the laws, particularly of the Old Testament, we, we very much tend to think in the legalistic way of, oh, here's something else that's laid on me. I can't do this. I have to be really careful that I don't do this because God will be angry at me and I have to be better than other people and I have to be better uh, than people who are bad. Those laws are meant to be blessings on our lives. They are meant to be something that we delight in. And that idea of delighting in the law of the Lord if you look in the Psalms, uh, if you look in Scripture, that is a common theme. Thirdly, we learn to live the blessed life by keeping God's judgments uh, or statements. So the word that the Psalm used is, uh, is keeping God's statutes. And if you're like me, a word like statutes it's not really a common word. It's not one that we're used to. It's not one that we that we use usually. And unless you're a lawyer, you don't use that in in everyday speech. Um, but it has to do with statements that God has made, uh, judgments 
that God has passed down. And this can mean laws that God has given. So for instance, uh, in the Old Testament, there's a statute that if you're, if you're bull, you have a bull, big, huge bull, and it gets out and it gores someone, uh, God has laid down a judgment that has to do with whether that the bull was being kept safely. You know, if you kept your bull on a fence or whether you're just letting it wander around freely when you knew that it was a, a dangerous animal. And it has to do with, um, it has to do with uh, liability and, and you're liable if you don't put that bull up and protect people much uh much more liable than if just if a bull breaks out well that's a completely different situation well that's sort of a legal statute that god lays down uh, but this word can also have to do with statements that god has laid down and and made and so for instance one that comes to mind which is one of the most important statutes or statements that god makes in all the old testament is from Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7, where, where God appears to Moses and says, The Lord, the Lord, gracious and compassionate, abounding in love. And that statement is, at least two times I can think of, repeated in the Psalms. It is, it is this statement that is, that is remembered. It is kept. And this, is, this word, uh, to keep God's statutes, this word, to keep is again it's one it's a very common word and it's one that we don't notice but to keep statutes or statements means it much more than merely remembering them uh, it has to do with something more like uh, treasuring something or holding on to something uh, so there's an illustration of um, if you've ever cleaned out a closet or you've cleaned out a drawer or you've cleaned out a room uh, you have three choices the first choice is uh, you can purge, get rid of everything, throw everything away, start new, clear the room, set a fire, whatever you do. The second is you can hoard, right? So you can just keep everything and everything is valuable. And so then you have to rearrange everything or maybe just leave it in the room. Don't bother cleaning it up. Um, that's another thing that you can do. I, I, was, I was working with a, a ministry in the county and uh, I was leading a, a cleanup for a house that we were working on. And it, it happened that in that, in that, um, with that property, that as I was wandering around, uh, we were cleaning the yard, there was a, a mound in the yard that had a piece of plywood over it and plastic over it. And I thought, what is this? So I, I moved the plywood and I pulled off the plastic and there were pots and pans. And they were actually, many of them were buried underneath the stack of pots and pans, there were a lot of them in the ground. And somebody was with me, they said, what should we do with these? Well, I've got a little bit of the purger mentality. I said, throw it away. Why, why would you keep these things? They were rusty, they were in bad shape. So we did, we threw them in a truck and we took them to the dump. Uh, then when the person came home, and almost the first thing they did was they came into the yard and they said, where are my pots and pans? And I thought, you've got to be kidding me. You want these things. Well, they were very upset that we had moved their pots and pans. I, that's hoarding. That is, that is the opposite of purging. What is, what is more balanced, though, is that when we go through a room or a drawer or, or a place to clean it out, is that we determine what's valuable, what is useful. And we keep that. We hold on to it because it's valuable. Um, this idea with God's proclamations, you can see, you can see in the, uh, in the Old Testament, as I just mentioned, that statement of God about his character, that is kept. It is repeated in the Psalms. Um, we actually, um, in our, in our own uh, practice as a, as, a, as a church in the New Testament era, uh, we, keep, we keep a statute that has been laid down by Jesus. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, 
we keep that as, as precious. Um, and there are more personal statements that God makes to us. So there are times in sermons where you may hear a sermon that affects you deeply, and it's as though God is speaking to you. Or you may be studying the scripture, and you may find something in the scripture where you think to yourself, this is so important, and this is a, a statement that I want to hold on to. Uh, or or you, may, um, you may hear something that, that strikes you deeply, that you feel like God has said to you. And the truth is that keeping these sorts of statements, returning to them, only makes them more valuable. The more that we reflect on statements like these that have been important to us, the more valuable, the more profound they become as we return to them again and again. They become part of our lives and part of our understandings of who we are as spiritual people. Uh, then we learn to live the blessed life uh, by seeking God with all our hearts. So uh, seeking God, just simply, you know, that word seek, people get hung up on that. What does it mean to seek? Uh, it's simply the most basic definition is, is that it means to look for God, to look uh, look for God in some way. But then again, that begs the question, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to look for God? Well, there are different ways of seeking God, and probably you'll tend to gravitate towards one way or another, uh, but all of them are important, and, and I'm just, there are three ways that I, that I want to mention. And the first is that we seek God by developing an understanding of who God is. And uh, generally, we do that through Scripture. We study Scripture. Uh, you might study the names of God. You might study um, Jesus, his interactions with people, uh, different ways of doing that. And that knowledge uh, that we gain about the character of God, and, and by the way, just an aside, a lot of times when I prepare sermons, the first thing that I ask as I'm looking at a passage is, who is God? Because almost every passage you'll ever look at in Scripture has something to say about who God is, whether explicitly or implicitly. And that is something that is incredibly important. It is formational to our lives, the, 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 the understanding of who this God is that we that we worship. Um, but that knowledge has to go beyond mere information. Um, seeking God in this way, it has to be more than being able to give a right answer about what God is like. It has to be about a growing appreciation and trust and love for God. What, what the Bible calls fullness of, fullness of knowledge, or, or the Greek word is epignosis. And it's a word that's used... Um, 20 times in, in the New Testament, uh, and I'd refer you to, to Colossians 3.10 or Ephesians 1.17. So this knowledge of God, um, though, though we can come to it through study, uh, it is a knowledge that affects us deeply because true knowledge of God really takes place when we believe it. So if I'm studying the goodness of God um, and and having a new understanding of what the goodness of God, what that term actually means. Um, while at the end of the day, that knowledge still only remains in my head, while my heart is still distrusting God, uh, then I don't have the full, fullness of knowledge. Uh, the fullness of knowledge is about a growing trust and love and appreciation for God through the things that we know about God. And that's what, that's what seeking God means with all our hearts uh, in terms of knowledge of God. Uh, we can also, another way, is that we can seek God by considering what God desires of us and what God desires to give to us and how God desires to bless us and renew our lives. And uh, how God is leading us through our reading of the word, or uh, our understandings, uh, through the counsel and the wisdom of other people, through the circumstances of life. Uh, this type of seeking is, is one 
It's less about the study of Scripture, and it's less about the knowledge of God. And it's more about uh, sensing through all the, all the communication that comes to me. I mean, think about it. You know, my circumstances and my, and my study of Scripture and, and conversations with people, all of that communication, God is speaking through all those things. And we need to not be blind to that. God communicates through all of these different ways. And to seek God with all of our heart um, is, is a way of discerning and listening um, to the voice of God, which is gracious, not critical, demanding, or harsh, but kind and gracious and, and drawing us towards good and love for others and for God's self. We're, we're gaining that information and submitting ourselves to what God is doing in our lives. So, you know, God has put me in a situation where I realize that God has called me to love a person who's difficult, then, then I'm submitting to that by learning to love that person and struggling with my attitudes and, and these things. And I'm doing that as a way of seeking God with all my heart. And then thirdly, we seek God by listening to God's communication to us um, through the word and through prayer. And that's a more sort of a, a personal communication. So there's a seeking of God about the circumstances and the direction of our life. And there's a seeking of God that is about the knowledge of God. But there is also a seeking of God that is becomes very personal. And it is about being able to receive from God, the love of God, our value as a human being made in God's image. God says in the scripture, as we've been knit together. That's, that's a very personal term in our mother's womb and, and made to be uh, this creature that God values above all other kinds of creature. And to receive that kind of personal communication often requires that we sit silently before God in a kind of silence that is a way of trying to open our hearts to God and receive what God may be saying to us. The, the thoughts may come into our mind, gracious thoughts, that are the communication of God. So this leads us to a, a, a deepening conversation with God, a deepening relationship with God, and a greater devotion to God, uh, seeking God with all our hearts. And this is part of the blessed life, part of a life that is, is not only stable, but beautiful and, and joyful and good. So the psalmist writes these verses as an ideal. Uh, um, they are uh, a vision of what the spiritual life is meant to do, be and, and do for us and in us. And uh, this was meant to lay a good foundation, a, a vision um, in, in, in a sense that it shapes our desire, our orientation uh, towards, uh, towards God and a desire for a holy and blessed life. And it's a vision that's meant to be received and, and to be rejoiced in, that, that this is what God actually wants for us. And um, it's meant to be our whole orientation towards God is meant to be that this is the God is good. God wants to bless us. But how often have so many of us come to the spiritual life with that foundation? Or how many of us have come under a sense of threat? Or under a sense of coercion? You know, I, I have to be a good person. Or uh, through false promises of things like wealth and prosperity or, or an easy life. Um, it doesn't take a lot of reflection to see how vastly um, these different foundations would affect a spiritual life and uh, set up a different orientation towards God. Um, the way that we respond to God is deeply affected by the way that we 
come to God, our orientation towards God. And if I, if I feel that God is the ever-present threat who's ready to condemn, my orientation is going to be very different than if I come thinking that God desires to bless me. Um, and I find it very interesting when I talk to people to ask them about their conversions, how they first came to faith. There may be a moment and there may not, but there's always a reason and there's always an orientation. And how that, how that profoundly affects the way they understand God and interact with God. So uh, this morning, um, in these first three verses, we've been given a vision of how God desires to shape our lives. It's an ideal. And the rest of the psalm is going to shape this ideal in the face of more practical struggles of our lives. Um, and I would encourage you, um, as, as we go on, uh, I'll be getting back to this in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, uh, I'd encourage you to think about the orientation through which you are, are coming to the spiritual life and um, to think about uh, what it would mean, what it would mean to come to God with this understanding, to, to shift our whole orientation with this understanding that God's desire is to bless your life through the pursuit of holiness and self-understanding and knowing God so that we can have lives that are, are good and stable and a blessing. Uh, let's pray. Father, thank you for this psalm and thank you for these verses and help us to truly consider our ways and particularly our way of coming to you, our way of approaching you and all that that has meant to us. Uh, show us how to come to you as a God of blessing and a God of love. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.